thank you very much, Alyssa, and uh, thank you, Skip, and uh, Nikolai, and the whole uh, Clinton School here. Uh, it's been a long time since this was a spaghetti warehouse. <laughs> but uh, that's how I remember this building. <laughs> Uh, although, of course, I've been back many times since. Um, I want to start with uh, talking a little bit about a home. Um, most uh, in this crowd would, would, would understand that uh, this is not an Arkansas accent coming out of the microphone here, but I do live here now, and uh, I came from East Lansing, Michigan. Um, and that's a, that's a place that I fiercely identify with, and, uh, and I'm constantly on the search for uh, fellow Spartan fans. So if you know any, I'm looking for people to watch games with. Ashley knows I'm. <laughs> um, this is also where uh, I met uh, Ashley Adams, who is now my wife and uh, has a very special place in my heart. Um, and uh, the irony of my interest in home is that, uh, and, and how that ties to this book is that doing a project like this requires me to leave home and uh, to be gone for extended periods of time. And uh, not, uh, Ashley, uh, of course, bears the brunt of that. And uh, and I have to say thank you for all the all that uh, support she gives me by putting up with my long absences. And of course, Don and Judy, her parents. Uh, do so much of that as well by supporting Ashley when I'm gone. So thank you to you all. Um, so uh, home is uh, is a place uh, that I think matters to everybody, where no matter where you live. And um, I did a, a, a book. Uh, my first book, as Alyssa mentioned, was called Rough Beauty, and uh, it's a series of photographs of a town in East Texas. And um, uh, maybe in a different talk, I'll show some pictures from that. But uh, that was a town that had a problematic reputation and uh, and also a fierce pride. And I kind of, despite its history, I was uh, I was very interested in uh, in that kind of pride and home that people had there. And uh, as I was wrapping up that project, uh, Katrina hit, and I don't think I had a a response that was significantly different from probably most of the people sitting in this room. I was horrified and heartbroken and and also uh, you know obviously you could tell from my background I'm a Democrat and um, I thought well even Bush can't screw this up he'll he'll uh, he'll get a lot of credit for helping fix all of this and then of course uh, that didn't turn out to be the case uh, although he had a lot of help in his incompetency from uh, all kinds of public officials so hopefully the Clinton School will kick out some people to to uh, to do some great public service um, and uh, Anyway, the, uh, when, when it all went wrong, there was, of course, a lot of photography. And I, I went down there uh, with uh, Chris Clement, who I don't know if he was able to make it tonight. He and I road tripped down there. And, uh, and I want to show a few photographs that were done in, uh, in New Orleans uh, after the storm that are not in the book, because the book is about a single block that I discovered later. Uh, so this is caked uh, uh, mud where, you know, everything just dried up and, you know, some of these things are going to look uh, fairly familiar to people. Um, and that was, I think, in Uptown somewhere. You'll notice also these are black and white. Um, I did a mix of black and white and color, but this, this project is a color project. Notice the... Uh, Notice the, the, the chair at the top of the tree. It's a little hard to make out, but it's a white chair. That's in the lower nine. And we were down, Chris and I were down there about two weeks after. And uh, my gallery down there was nice enough to let us crash on the floor. Uh, and uh, I, then we walked around uh, taking pictures in the lower nine and came home and I uh, snuck off to the hospital one morning after returning, didn't tell Ashley because I thought I had some weird chemical thing and it turned out the fleas from the gallery cat had attacked my leg. <laughs> the, those fleas were hungry. No one had been around for a while. Um, this, is, uh, this is right where the breach occurred um, in the lower nine and uh, 
obviously, you know, there's, there's no shortage of, of photos of how bad it was and, um, you know, it, it was overwhelming. Uh, the, you know, there's weird things that when you're actually down there looking at it right in the aftermath that, that, uh, that can really freak you out. What, what really got to me was driving down a road uh, just and it was a grid pattern all the roads in that neighborhood and uh, coming to an intersection that we couldn't cross because there was a house in the intersection and I just love this place they stayed open through the storm um, St. Claude used tires and I see a grin back there I bet uh, I bet he knows what it is um, this was a, a, a tire repair place on St. Claude and they were open all through the storm. I think only them and uh, one of the bars down in the French Quarter stayed open. And of course, they had a lot of work to do because everyone was messing up their tires driving through there. Um, and they had this great sign, and I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but it basically says, uh, no crack selling, no cat selling. These is the rules. <laughs> So this is uh, one of the first color images, and uh, that was taken um, right near where that, that other image with a car, um, and that is where the, uh, the levee broke. And basically my back was to the, 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 the giant barge that had come through the levee. Um, uh, maybe I'll pause here and just uh, mention that this photograph and a couple of others that will follow were selected to be in an exhibition in Houston uh, about a year after the storm, uh, or maybe a little less than that. And I went down and there was a panel of photographers and the discussion was about, you know, why you took the pictures and what were you thinking and what do you hope uh, your work um, will lead to. And a, a couple of the other photographers, all of whom had done really interesting work, were talking about the photographs they'd done of Katrina, and they said, you know, I just thought the world had to see what went on there, uh, and, and things to that end. And I had a kind of a strangely negative reaction to that response, because my thought was, okay, here we are, it's a bunch of fine art photographers showing pictures of a storm that was extremely well documented. The world already knows what happened there, and we're sitting here preaching to the converted. Uh, you are not changing the world with these photographs. Uh, and by the way, neither am I. Um, and that was, that was a frustrating thing because I have this background in public service, and I wanted to do something about this place that, uh, that documented it and showed something of it, but I didn't, I didn't want to pretend that the photographs were all that important. Um, 139 Lakeview, the house was gone, but he set up, uh, this is actually across the, across the lake, and you can't really make it out, but there's, um, there's a Coleman stove in there. Uh, photography uh, aficionados might recognize a, uh, a tip of the hat to William Eggleston, the color photographer. That was my little Eggleston light. This was at a place called the Sugar Bowl. I love this picture, and I can't figure out how to, I couldn't put it in my book, but I love it so much, so glad to have an opportunity to show it off. Okay, so one block. So I racked my brain to figure out what, what to do, and I kept coming back to this idea that all this photography had been done from floating bodies to people at the Superdome to everything being submerged, and it was all about destruction. And it was a very important photography to be shown, but the one thing that it really didn't get at, and water lines on buildings and all that kind of stuff, the one thing that it really didn't get at was what are people's lives like after that. And thinking about where I come from and the subtle changes that happen in my hometown, whether it's an old restaurant that I loved closing or a new parking lot showing up or a building getting knocked down, those, you know, when I go home to East Lansing, those, there's a little, you know, there's a little heartbreak in each of those when you have a sense of a place that you love and it changes. So then what then of people from New Orleans? It's, their city was turned upside down, They're, they were thrown out of the city, they, some people could go back, some people couldn't afford to. So I really wanted to do something that 
try, attempted to get at the sense of community. And it's very hard to show sense of community through a photograph. Um, that's much easier with video. Um, so the thing that I, I, uh, I came up with was this idea of focusing on a single block and photographing it over time. And after a lot of research, uh, I settled on a neighborhood called Holy Cross, which is in the Lower Ninth Ward. And I liked this neighborhood because it was a mixture of black and white. It sort of was, it was kind of demographically like pre-Katrina New Orleans. It was a little more black than white. Uh, it was, you know, poor, tended towards being poor, but it wasn't destitute. And, um, uh, and I also like the fact that this neighborhood, as you can see, these are sizable houses and uh, I would let me how many people have uh, gotten the impression from media coverage that the Lower Ninth Ward is a bunch of shacks yeah right so it's not um, and these are some some spectacular houses so this is early on and you can see it was they were not crushed this did not get the worst of the water they got about six feet but there was wind damage. Uh, every house on the block was gutted. One got hit by a tornado. Um, this home belonged to a woman who was in her early 90s, was the absolute life of the block. Everyone loves her, uh, named Miss Doris, who was a 90-year-old woman who had a, uh, uh, just a foul mouth, and everyone just loved her. <laughs> we're we're going to have a block party this Saturday on the block. Everyone's invited. And we're very much hoping Miss Doris can come. Um, it's very hard for her to come back to the block. She hasn't been, she's only been back once in three years. And she cries every time she sees it. And uh, other people on the block who saw her photos in the book cried when they saw the picture of her. She was very religious. You can see the Jesus uh, image above the door. And she loved Christmas. She kept her Christmas tree up year round. So you can see, I wasn't getting there when everything was mayhem. I was getting there when it had kind of been cleaned up and people were starting to get back on their feet. He's, he, uh, Nigel is lying in the shadow of a FEMA trailer and across the street is a home of, of a couple of photographers who are the best known, uh, uh, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, who are well known uh, photographers of the Lower Ninth Ward. They lost 70% of their negatives from the last 30 years in the storm when their house went down. Um, I, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't swear from the stage, so I'll just encourage people to look at his t-shirt in the book. It's, I think it's a little too hard to make out here, but it's funny. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is an interesting uh, hoop. Uh, it showed up on the street and kids started playing at it and then it got destroyed and then another hoop would show up and then it would get destroyed and these hoops just kept going up. Uh, this is Mac McClendon. Now this is very interesting. If you went to his house today, there's always a bunch of activity around his house and it never seems to be going anywhere and this was taken right at the beginning and his house still kind of looks like this but there's been all this activity. Um, but he, what he spent most of his time on is starting a, the Lower Ninth Ward um, village, which is the first community center built since the storm. And he's, he's quite a character. And any, any students who've been down there to the Lower Nine have probably ended up at his place. This is Maxine Richardson. Um, and uh, she, uh, she is the self-proclaimed black grandma to uh, Ashley and my son Noah. Uh, and I loved her dearly. And she also had a uh, she was not a sweet old lady. She was a stern old lady, but she was full of love, and uh, and um, uh, and her family was fiercely devoted to her. And uh, she passed away just before the book came out, which is uh, really sad. She, by the way, was this is in her FEMA trailer. She was living there with her daughter Hermanese and her granddaughter Sheena. Uh, her granddaughter Sheena needed about. They both worked at one of the big bars in the French Quarter. Um, and, uh, and Sheena would go to, um, would take money that she was earning and go stay at a hotel um, each week for a night because she just had to get away. And it was not that she was fighting. It was just that, you know, 
Um, it was so hard. Uh, Stacy and Augustine, they agreed to come back uh, to the block together so that they could keep an eye on each other. Um, Stacy is a fascinating character. Anyone who gets down there to see the block should uh, talk to her. She ran the Peace Corps in Afghanistan in the 70s. You can imagine that's a tough woman. Um, she had two heart attacks and her dog, Licorice, was poisoned with formaldehyde that came out of her FEMA trailer. Um, and she's considering moving, sadly. She, she renovated the most beautiful block on the building. It's an absolute treasure. And Augustine is, your, is, a, is a prototype, you know, matriarch, center of her family, uh, just as nice as nice can be, really insists on seeing photos of my kids first whenever I'm visiting. That's Pinky. I love this photo, not, not just because it's a cute dog photo, but because this is what everyone felt like at the time. They were just feeling it. And Pinky kind of personified it. He, that was in the house of Marcus, and, uh, Marcus Whitman and his wife, Lisa. Um, and uh, uh, they put me up every time I was down there, and I'll be staying with them this week. Keith and uh, uh, Keith is the photographer whose house went down, and that's Mac again. That's Marcus. puts me up. I love Marcus. The Black Party, I should say, is uh, sponsored in part by the Oxford American. So, thank you to the OA. Uh, they're providing some great music. That's Lisa. Um, there's a quote in the book about people sharing um, uh, all kinds of equipment to get their yards back in order. Including, including weed whackers. That's Miss Doris on her last visit to the block about two and a half years ago uh, with, uh, with Stacy and uh, Sheena and um, Miss Augustine. A funny story about this, this is Calvin Alexander uh, who lives on the block. I think he looks like Morgan Freeman. Uh, the OA had that benefit honoring Morgan Freeman. So I told Calvin I was going to do this. I went up to Morgan Freeman. I said, you look just like Calvin Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> and then I showed him the photo and told him why. <laughs> this is Bruce on the roof. This picture to me sort of sums up the whole project. You know, it's rebuilding a house, the sense of history and family. Um, and that's actually uh, Gregory working on his parents' home who'd moved to Natchez and he was hoping they would come home. They haven't come back yet. You'll see there's a number of images that sort of hint at hope and, and before and after images. That's actually the same house that Gregory was in. He's repainted it, the outside, with crazy colors multiple times, so it doesn't even look like that anymore. Maxine, again, after she'd finally gotten back into her house. She developed cancer, and I didn't have the heart to say it to her family members, but I always wonder, I've always i been wondering whether the cancer came from her FEMA trailer. That's a number of the images in the book are of people working on the block. That was a guy named Joseph Pomfrey, who Mac uh, owns a junkyard. And Joseph, when he came down uh, to work, stayed on a couch in the junkyard without air conditioning in the middle of the summer. He was in his 60s. That's Joseph's arm. So it's just a lot of building to be done, a lot of measuring and remeasuring. And sometimes people were doing the work on their own home, and sometimes they had contractors. So uh, once the book was finished and I was showing it to people on the block, it was always entertaining to show it to people on the block. The reaction to this photo was, Chandra, she clearly doesn't know how to use a, a level. She's a wonderful photographer, though. Stacy in the background, she was kind of hot for her lawn boy. <laughs> Maxine's house before and after. This is an interesting thing. In that earlier photo of the boy in the grass uh, with the collapsed building in the background, um, this is a historic district. So you have to rebuild your home to historic um, specs. And Maxine had lived there for a long time with her kids, and um, she uh, hired builders, and they went to work on it. They put in, you know, windows to replace the windows that had, uh, you know, had been ruined, and um, 
And then word comes down that the windows are no good because the building next to her had collapsed, therefore making her house a corner house, even though she's not actually on the corner. And because you're a corner house, the windows along the side facing the corner have to be historically accurate. So there goes Maxine's money. She's got to get new windows. And she obviously wasn't swimming in it. That's Gregory, who's on the ladder. And a before and after of the interior of uh, Maxine's home. The little kid, her, one of her great, great grandchildren at the end of the hall. Photographs, I think, have to stand on their own, but sometimes they're, uh, they're better with a story, and this is certainly an example of that. Um, uh, this, this is a photo album that belonged to a guy named Danny Santiago, and you can see the house has been pretty destroyed, and, um, uh, but the, this photo album is kind of in a place of honor, and he, uh, Danny showed me, went through page after page of this photo album, and he and his wife had coached a girls' volleyball team for many years, and uh, had tons of pride in it, and was showing me each of the photos. This is the night we told the, that we brought them to the awards banquet, and told them to dress up because they're not just athletes; they're young women, and you know, just a lot of a lot of things about his philosophy on life and their in him and his wife's love for these girls they were coaching. Here's the thing: you couldn't see anything in any of the photos; they had all been washed away with water, and he had them all memorized. It's Mac's house. It still looks like that. That's Stacy in the early days. Uh, she did a lot of work herself on her house. She had contractors too, but she's a real perfectionist and she loves historic preservation. I didn't know anything about building. When I got up on this roof, I learned that roofs are made of wood. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I thought they were made of, you know, the stuff you see on top. <laughs> Makes sense given some of our building history. <laughs> this one uh, always needs some explanation. There was a house uh, owned by a woman named Sarah Lasty, and it stalled out almost immediately after uh, it started being worked on. And I took some pictures of the stalled out structure. And then I saw these nails, and I thought, these are going to just sit here. And so I photographed the nails every time I went down until eventually they disappeared. Um, there was a happy ending, which is a, a, a famous artist came and did an installation on her property and was so taken with her plight, uh, she had basically been ripped off by incompetent contractors, um, that um, the artist donated proceeds of a whole bunch of her art to Sarah so that she could build a new house. Uh, most artists don't generate enough income to build houses, but this particular artist could. And, um, uh, and so she has a beautiful, beautiful new house that's open now, and she's so proud of it. It's Augustine's kitchen. She changed it from blue, which is too bad. That's Stacy on her porch over time. Those are rugs she brought back from Afghanistan when she was there in the 70s. Um, one of them, a beautiful rug, although they'd all been kind of ruined by the storm. They, she, she hadn't gotten them elevated enough. Um, one of them, done in the mid-70s, was an elaborate pattern of machine guns, which shows that not a lot of things change. So she worked on every single thing in her house. Um, the, this is one of seven um, uh, mantles that, are, that went around her fireplaces. Not real fireplaces, sort of decorative ones. But she was there in the morning with her cigarettes and her beer and working the way through the day. Um, so she had, Stacy had uh, molding around the, uh, crown molding around this room that had, you know, had to be taken down in large part. She had gone through every single speck of dust in that pile to recover bits of the crown molding so she could rebuild it. Stacy got a cut. 
Stacy detailing a mirror. Before and after of Stacy's hallway. Hard work pays off. That's licorice who was poisoned. And she's a new dog that makes me miss licorice even more. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> There's no crazy, there, there's, <laughs> he was scaring some kids for fun. It wasn't Halloween. That's the new obnoxious dog across the street. That's Augustine's new obnoxious dog that she's now gotten rid of. Now so we just have to get uh, uh, Stacy to get rid of hers. Maxine uh, pulling the weeds. And this is an important thing, actually. When people started working out in their gardens and pulling weeds and putting flowers in, that was when you knew uh, things had turned the corner. Now, this looks like a happy ending, right? Well, the contractor painted the exterior and took off on him. So the inside's not done. There's a broken out window gathering water inside. Mystery chickens. These chickens just showed up. It took me a couple days to chase them down. And Stacy and her sister Tucky, who came in to help her multiple times on the, on the front, on Stacy's front porch. There's Augustine planting flowers. She lived in Little Rock for a while after the storm with her mother, and now they're back in New Orleans. Death, uh, destiny. See, people were fragile and uh, still are. There's a great story here. This actually wasn't there during the storm. This is on the property of Marcus and Lisa. Um, they had lived in Treme, and um, the, uh, the storm hit, and they had pulled everything out of the yard. They had a swimming, above ground swimming pool, and this thing, which is like three or four different pieces, but all very heavy. Uh, well, not the ashtray, of course, but the concrete was. They just left it there. They came back after, after the storm, and the swimming pool was on the roof, and this was sitting where the swimming pool was, 30 feet away, perfectly intact, with everything on top of it. I don't, it had to be a tornado or, or, or a prankster neighbor, but they thought it was a tornado. I don't even know how a tornado does that. Uh, Corey's, uh, Miss Augustine picks up Corey at daycare every day. And that's Danny Santiago. And this makes a good point about this whole project. You know, you're seeing a number of homes that are, are, are wrapping up and close to finished and Danny's just getting started and having lost a lot of money to a contractor. Calvin and Natalie. <laughs> Actually, can you make the sign up there? It says no, and this is B-U-L-L, -L, and then they ripped out the rest of it. If anyone was at the Democratic Convention, there's a shot of Jimmy Carter uh, in a tribute video with him, of him walking up to this house and giving her a hug and talking to her. All right. That's it. <laughs> Okay, we have, uh, we have time for some questions. If you'll raise your hands and, and then we'll get the microphones to you. Taylor, right back there. Uh, hey, Mr. Anderson, I'm Taylor Ballinger. I'm a member of the uh, class of 2012 here at the Clinton School and just like to thank you again for coming. Um, what's been the general reaction of the various folks that you photoed in and around the Holy Cross area. Have they been pleased with the book? Is there more things that they wish you had included? Just kind of the general reaction. Um, it's, it, this was something I was really nervous about. Um, you know, I thought I'd done something that was a nice tribute to the area, but I didn't know. You, never, you, you could spell someone's name wrong and they'll never forgive you. Um, in fact, I did. <laughs> um, but. Um, uh, I took the books around uh, last month and brought a copy to each house and in fact it was an uh, incredibly warm reaction and um, 
uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, one of the great professional moments I've had is just uh, the warmth that came from, from the book. And, and the Maxine, the, the pictures of her, uh, since they came, the, uh, just a matter, uh, the book arrived just a matter of weeks after her funeral. Um, that was, uh, well, I told Ashley this story. Um, I had heard that she had passed away, and I went in to bring them the book, and I, um, first we just spent some time talking about her and her passing and uh, reminiscing a little bit, and, um, and then I took out the book, and I, I didn't know how to deal with the fact that, you know, she was prominent, and in fact, the back cover is a picture of her, and so, um, I pulled it out, showing showing Hermione's and her grandchildren and uh, uh, and some others that were there. The front cover, and you know, they had all been we, talking in very serious tones about you know we're getting through it, we're you know we're okay, you know it's hard, but you know it was time for her to go and all all of those kinds of things. And um, I took it out and and then showed him the front, and then I turned it around, and then everybody started crying myself included because we all missed her I mean them especially but it's it's been really nice nobody's mad at me that I know of someone anybody else there? question someone up there question all right yeah Dewey <clears throat> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was really nervous because at that point, uh, people were photographing uh, the city constantly, and especially in the Lower Ninth. And so I had, I had initially um, leaned against even doing a project in the Lower Ninth. That when I whittled down the, the list of areas, I was choosing between this block and a, an incredibly wealthy neighborhood uh, called Old Metairie. Um, uh, I'm glad I cho chose this one, but and that would have been a completely different project. Um, but I was very careful because, you know, people were coming and photographing in the in this neighborhood every single day. There had been a lot of people through photographers, reporters, do-gooders of all stripes. Uh, people had already been you know, had promises made and broken. Uh, some very grand. Um, there's a house on the block that a major national architectural association had promised to rebuild and they hadn't. And, um, and then every single day you're standing on that block, there's a, a bus full of tourists coming through snapping photos. Um, and so what I said to people was that um, I wanted to be very careful not to make grand promises, that I, I, was, I cared about New Orleans, I wanted to do something that was meaningful, um, it wasn't, you know, I couldn't promise that my photos would be happy or purely promotional uh, or anything like that. I just wanted to track life um, and, uh, and uh, you know, if I could do something that would be beneficial, whether it was raising money for the neighborhood or uh, at the time I was interested in perhaps doing a, a, a film that, that went along with it, which we weren't able to do for funding reasons. Um, the, uh, I just, you know, I said I will try, but I won't promise anything because I know you're sick of, of promises. Um, so people, I think people respected that candor. Um, and, uh, and then when I started taking pictures, I, uh, um, uh, Mary Togni, who works as my assistant, can attest to the hours and hours and hours uh, she had to print photos of people on the block that I would then, she'd stick it in a little Epson box and I'd drive down to New Orleans with it and then I'd be handing them out as I was taking pictures. So there ended up being um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, photos handed out on the block and I think probably that as much as anything, um, you know, went a long ways. And I, I should, uh, I neglected to thank Mary at the beginning of this. Um, she's been an incredibly uh, central part of the uh, developing this project and getting it over the top. So thank you, Mary. Um, Kim. Hi, my name is Kim Caldwell and I'm a second year Clinton School student and I want to thank you so much for being here. And um, 
I'm curious to hear what you learned through this process about rebuilding and resilience. Get a generator. <laughs> own a generator. <laughs> of course, I don't own one yet. I keep talking about it, but we haven't gotten one. Um, but in terms of rebuilding uh, and resilience, I mean, you, you just, uh, <laughs> I think the most basic thing is don't let the bastards get you down because there's so many of them, uh, especially in a process like this. Um, in, in some more direct ways, I mean, I, I talked a lot about Stacy Rockwood. There's a photo that isn't in the presentation or the book of, of piles of, um, of uh, paperwork that she had, including one that's actually called How to Sue Your Contractor. Um, she went through four. Um, uh, you've got to pick good contractors. But the other thing was that, and you know, uh, Clinton School students listen closely, <laughs> that bureaucracy, the bureaucracy that people had to go through down there was staggering. And um, I don't even think it was, I mean, I guess people were getting money back from the government and from various sources, but it was, it was, uh, it was its own form of torture for people. And Stacy has a master's. She's run organizations. She's been a school principal. She is doggedly determined at everything she do does, and she was flummoxed. So if she was flummoxed by the utter BS that and the the hoops and the like, the bizarre Escher-like process as you had to go through to to do whatever you're supposed to do today, even though it might change tomorrow. Um, if she was flummoxed, imagine people who are easily intimidated by bureaucracy and have always been treated badly by it. It was, it was terrible. So you don't have a choice is really the lesson. And you, gotta, you have to figure out some way to stay sane and get through it. Um, you know, I don't think there's any quick lesson, really. Any other questions? Thursday, there's one right here. Yes, sir. Was the, was the fact that this was a historic district a deterrent to volunteer groups such as church groups and others coming in to help these folks rebuild their homes? No, there, there are so many volunteers. Uh, uh, they didn't need any encouragement. They just show up in vans and pour out into someone's yard half the time. Although, um, uh, no, so there, there, was, uh, there was a lot of work done. It's interesting, though, there, there, was, um, there was, to me, there was kind of a creepy element to the volunteers sometimes. Um, you know, it was sort of like they were so proud of themselves, and it was like they, they were so, there was a lot of really self-congratulatory, we just wanted to help you, we just really wanted to help you, like they deserved every last hug and kiss for their three days there. And... Um, it's important, and they made eff they made far more effort than 99% of 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 everyone else in the country. So, I don't want to be too cruelly dismissive of the good works that they did, but there is a patronizing quality to that work that that went on that um, that could get frustrating to people. Um, and in fact, one anecdote I always tell, it's not volunteer related, it's back to those buses and people coming by and photographing. And anyone who's seen the show Treme, there, there's this uh, on HBO, which is about post-Katrina New Orleans. And um, there's a great scene where uh, a, a group of um, uh, men are standing by the, uh, on a street and a bus comes by and, it's, and the windows are tinted, which is true, they're always tinted. And then you just, you see, these, these figures, and then these flashes of, of, of the camera and going off. And can you imagine living your life where that's what comes through your yard every day? You feel it would be hard not to feel like you're in a zoo. Um, and, uh, and I had to be careful because in a way, that's what I was doing. I was down there snapping photos. I was trying to be more diligent about what I was doing and more thoughtful, but in a way I was no better than, than these kind of rubberneckers that were coming through. And again, it's important to witness that, you know, 
it's a weird thing because there is some real value in people going to, I'm sure there are people in this room who've done that tour, and I, I'm not saying this to, to say you're all horrible people, because I did it too. Um, you know, it's, it's a weird thing, like what do you do? You go see this place that's been destroyed in many ways, and you want to witness it, you want to take it into your heart and try to do whatever you can in your own way to help that situation be avoided. But there's also this weird flip side to, to that, and there's no sort of right thing to do. You, don't you shouldn't necessarily avoid it, but you need to be cognizant of what, what, you're, what you're up to when you're in a place like that. All right, I got it. She, she's got, I'm gonna give the microphone to her. <laughs> Dave is my son-in-law, and last week I was in New Orleans, and I thought I might get a few brownie points if I would text him and say, where is the block? And so I did, and he texted back, do you want to go there? And I said, sure. We headed out there, and his next question was, do you want to meet the people? I didn't really want that many brownie points, but I said, <laughs> sure. So something that Dave didn't say was, I was amazed with Marcus and Lisa. They did not live there. They had just always loved that area. And they actually moved there from Los Angeles and bought their house and have done all of the remodeling. But Marcus told me a funny story. I said, so how, how does Dave end up staying with you? This is how Dave endears himself to the people on the block. Marcus says he's on the roof. Dave's already told you what he thinks the roof's made out of. So that tells <laughs> us a little bit about how comfortable he is with things. So he says he looks down and there's this fellow with cameras all over his neck hanging down and he's climbing up the ladder. And he Oh my gosh, he's going to kill himself. Anyway, he said, hey, I'm Dave Anderson, and I want to do a project on your block. And Marcus said, okay. And he said, and I need a place to stay. Can I stay here? And he said, sure. But <laughs> <laughs> they love Dave. They are so appreciative of this. They're so looking forward to the block party, of which I'm going back to, and I'd love for anybody else to join me at the block party this week. They can help take care of Maddie and, and Noah, who are five, <laughs> who are five and three. So. <laughs> Uh, let me just uh, skip. I know you have to wrap up, but th that's that's not that's Marcus has some revisionist history there because he invited me to stay there. I was staying somewhere. Yeah, else. we got that one. You're taking on your mother-in-law in public. That's tough. <laughs> any, any other questions? Thursday, Dave's ex exhibit opens at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans, and anybody that's ever been to the Ogden knows what a first-class museum that is. And then Saturday, of course, the block party at One Block as America looks and commemorates five years. Uh, Katrina, Dave, you've done a great job. And we thank you for coming to the Clinton School as we commemorate the fifth anniversary of Katrina. Ladies and gentlemen, buy this book. Let Dave sign it and enjoy the great reception following. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>